Heavenly Father, O Creator of the universe, ancient of days, whose glory is on high and fills the whole earth, will you be with us this morning? And will you give us your peace? In your name I pray. Amen. We're starting in in Advent, and every week we've been going over asking this question. What is Advent? And what does it mean to wait in Advent? In the Christmas season, it occurs to me that we get very easily caught up in the things of the season. And we forget the process of Advent. As the preacher here this morning, I just want to go over what that looks like. It's a four-step process in, uh, in the Word according to Palmer. You'll find this nowhere like listed out in Scripture. So this is just sort of my thoughts on the subject. First, Advent, we're waiting in Advent, starts with sin. Now, sometimes this is our sin, and sometimes this is other people's sin. Uh, and sin is, I want to I, I wanna talk about sin uh, as I have been in this Advent series as something more than personal transgression. It certainly is personal transgression that falls under the category of sin. But sin is basically everything that's wrong with this world. So it, it starts there. And as we start to notice it, we begin to get frustrated. We know that something is wrong. And so we move from sin to being stuck. And this is stuck in the sense where our own efforts can't change things, nor can any other efforts. This part can, can be kind of deceiving if you don't pay attention to it. Because it's one thing to say things are broken, but it's quite another thing to say, and there is no fixing it. Since George Washington became president of the United States, every four years, a president either has to defend his term, and it's always against somebody else who starts with the first thing, saying something's broken, and we're stuck, and I'm the answer, right? In fact, um, and I don't mean to bring politics into this morning, our current president crystallized it in his first bid for presidency. Yes, we can, was his message to the nation. That was his whole platform was built off of that. Every single president of the United States has said that exact same thing. Things are broken and we're stuck, and yes, we can fix it. We can. The problem is, you go through cycle after cycle after cycle of, of these two things. At some point, somebody who's got some sense has to say, not just to the president, but to everybody in the world who's trying to fix sin in their own way, no, you can't. And I think that probably every president of the United States, when they leave their term of office or terms of office, would probably get a little bit of this truth. We're always starry-eyed when we go into the election season because we receive this message. It's broken, we're stuck, but yes, we can. We can fix it. And at the end of that term of office, somebody has their head hung a little bit saying, no, I didn't. There are still problems. And there's somebody else, a new guy, who walks in and says, yes, we can. We have to break that cycle. And that's what the, this stage of Advent is. Getting to the point where we say, no, we can't. This is broken. My personal moral failings are not going to be fixed by trying harder. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried. My addictions are not going to be fixed by coming up with some other answer, some new answer. At some point, exhaustion sets in and the person who is truly in search of God will say, no, it's still broken, I'm exhausted, and there is no answer. Sin, stuck, and then screaming. 
This is the point in time where the person who's stuck and exhausted starts crying out and saying, help, help, help. I was watching this show on the Discovery Channel, and there are these creatures of the deep, deep ocean are luminescent, or they call them bioluminescent. In other words, they communicate by blinking. Now, you can imagine that when you're in the dark and everything wants to eat something, that if you're blinking, there's danger around. <clears throat> there's this certain type of jellyfish that as it's floating around, if something is coming to eat it, and all hope is lost, it has this really bright flashing pattern. That's, that's unmistakable. The jellyfish has this ring of, of lights around it, and they start going crazy like an alarm. And in fact, that's what the scientists call it. They call it the jellyfish alarm. What it does is it calls every predator in the area to its location. The jellyfish, in essence, is saying, help, 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 and he's ringing the dinner bell for somebody. There's these giant Humboldt squid that are really good at picking out this pattern. And they go immediately to it, not to eat the jellyfish, but to eat whatever's eating the jellyfish. The reason that I bring that up is because when we're screaming and when we're crying out, it's sort of like admitting that there's blood in the water and that the sharks are circling, that our destruction is on hand and that we have no other option. And by ringing this alarm, you are uh, sort of not just admitting to vulnerability, but in a sense, opening up a brand new channel of vulnerability, going to the extreme of vulnerability. When you are finally at the place and you hit your knees and you're screaming and you turn your face upwards and you give out a cry for help. That is the third phase of Advent. Now the fourth is when we get an answer. That word, answer, what I kind of want you to cling to this morning, it means God sees the alarms that we're sending up, that God can tell when we're on our knees and we're crying and we're screaming to Him and we're saying, I'm so stuck, I'm so lost, what I've got right now isn't working. Once you do that, you can expect Advent. Advent literally means, the word literally means arrival. What it means is that God is going to kick open the door to that dark room that you're in. He is going to come in with alarms, with all the alarms going off, and He's going to do something. Now, as we have been going through our Advent series, we have been able to see a pattern that when God shows up, we can know for certain that it is God because God is the only being in the universe that is the sovereign creator, the mighty God. In Genesis, we saw that people were hiding from his holy presence when they heard him in the garden after they sinned. And God called out, to Adam. Adam, where are you? And Adam said, I was afraid for I heard your voice. I realized I was naked and I was ashamed, so I hid. And God proceeds to talk to the three characters of the story, to the serpent, to the woman, and to the man. And what God does is he totally changes the rules. That's how we know that he's God. He changes the rules. When God shows up in Advent, there's times where, where he doesn't show up in Advent. He's talking with someone, he's doing something. Um, but these times, these moments, especially in the Old Testament, where God steps onto the scene, he wins the fight. He's the only God and the only being who can win a fight by pulling the rug out from underneath his opponents. See, the devil, the serpent, can break rules. He can tempt people to break rules. Adam and Eve can be deceived, and Adam and Eve can break rules. But nobody can change the rules except for God. And that he does. And these rules are always filled 
with grace. Every time God shows up in Advent, we find more grace. So to Adam and Eve, he put them out of the garden, put them away from the tree of life. He gave them the blessing, the grace of work, of pain in childbirth. He promised to the serpent he would one day be crushed. He promised to Eve that though you have been deceived, it is you who through bearing a child will defeat this serpent. It will be your offspring that crushes the head of the serpent. And as he tells man, you are going to work hard as a grace and you will die. That's how the serpent becomes a dust eater. He can no longer eat living flesh, but only people after they've died. So this end goal of the serpent has been totally usurped. In the second week, we looked at Moses, who comes to this holy burning bush. God sort of changes the rules of how nature works, and he says, up till this point in time, there has been no nation on earth that was mine and I'm going to send you to draw them out. And he has this showdown with another god called Pharaoh, and he totally smashes him by changing the rules of nature quite literally. And he draws the people of Israel up out of Egypt, and he gives them his presence. And we looked last week at Solomon's dedication of the temple. We looked at... Solomon's plea with God to change the rules, that no matter where anyone was, they would be able to accept God's forgiveness, that they would be able, even if they were in a faraway land, even if they couldn't come to the temple where a portion of God's presence was, I want to say captured, but captured puts people in power, where God puts his presence into a spot so that people can know where to go to find him. He gives them that grace. And Solomon says, forgive us, God. No matter where we're at, no matter what we're doing, even if we're far away from the temple and we've sinned incredibly and there's famine, there's pestilence, there's wars all upon us, if we so much as turn our face toward this temple and raise up our hands and say, God, forgive me. God, would you forgive us? And God comes to Solomon and he says, yes, you have unlimited forgiveness provided that your heart stays true to me. We saw that immediately after God left, Solomon's heart was turned from God. It's into this context that I want to speak this morning. We're going to be reading from a passage we're going to be reading from two passages, and the first <clears throat> is 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 1 through 16. It says 15 up there, but that's wrong. God had done this new thing, not by only having a nation and, and being their king, but the people needed this more grace of having a leader that they could put their eyes on, that they could see in battle. Uh, one of the problems with God's being the king of Israel in the book of Judges is that it's really hard to get people to trust in something that they can't see. So they reject God as their king, and they say, why don't you be the king of kings? Why don't you sort of remove yourself by one layer of bureaucracy? Because the whole nation cannot follow you consistently but we're betting that if there's just one man, there's just one guy, and that's his job, to follow the Lord and be his representative before the people, this is going to solve the problem. And we see time and time and time again that it does not. That that one guy who's in charge, who's over the whole nation of Israel, actually can't keep it together. He's got one thing to do, and that is be in love with God. That's it. That's all he does. God takes care of everything else. Lead the people towards the Lord. And king after king after king turns away from God. Now, last week we did this introduction to temple theology, which means that God is housed in this place. And as Isaiah says, he says, I looked up on high and I saw God in all of his glory. 
And there were seraphim, or cherubim, that flew before the throne, crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And he said, I looked, and there his clothing, the hem of his robe, the spot at which God touched earth, was not him, but his robe, and where it touched down was in our temple. And the whole temple was filled with this cloud. We talked last week about this thick darkness, the cloudy cloud, this fog that shields God's glory and his holiness from people so that they can come towards him without being annihilated. The text that we're going to read today, this first text, is about a king who finds himself marred and stuck, not just by his own sin and moral failings and his turning from God. Um, this is the king of Judah, and at the same time, there's, there's sort of four players here, excuse me, five players here. There's Judah in the south, Edom to the east, Syria and Israel are the direct northern neighbors, and then just a little bit past Syria and Israel and Edom is this nation called Assyria. Now, everybody starts ganging up on Judah, with the exception of Syria, and they find themselves up to their necks in a war that they can't win, but they can't quite lose. Uh, all of the enemy soldiers have marched in, they've taken a few towns, they have taken a lot of prisoners, and the king in his castle is closed up. Israel, Syria, and Edom can't quite finish the job, but they're just wreaking devastation, and Judah cannot defend itself. So King Ahaz starts crying out, and this is the story that we're going to read about King Ahaz's crying out and how that works out for him. I'll be reading from the ESV. In the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Ahaz, son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. He even burned his son as an offering according to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. And he sacrificed and made offerings on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Then Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, king of Israel, came up to wage war on Jerusalem. And they besieged Ahaz, but could not conquer him. At that time, Rezin, the king of Syria, recovered Eloth for Syria and drove the men of Judah from Eloth, and the Edomites came to Eloth, where they dwell to this day. So Ahaz sent messengers to tiglath Pilasar, king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son. Come up and rescue me from the hand of the king of Syria, from the hand of the king of Israel, who are attacking me. We're just going to pause there. Ahaz is going along in the process of Advent so beautifully, isn't he? And he gets to the part where it's time for him to scream, time for him to call out, to cry out. And who does he cry out to? To Assyria, to the king of Assyria. And he pledges his service and his sonship, which rightfully belongs to God, to another false god. And this sort of derails the Advent process. It derails the Advent process not because God won't come, but because it changes the answer that God will give. Let's read on. Ahaz also took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house and sent a present to the king of Assyria. King of Assyria listened to him. The king of Assyria marched up against Damascus and took it, carrying its people captive to Ker, and he killed Rezin. When King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet with tiglath Pilasar, king of Assyria, he saw the altar that was in Damascus. And King Ahaz sent to Uriah the priest a model of the altar and its pattern, exact in all its details. You notice something crazy? Does Ahaz and do Judah get rescued? Yes, they do. Were they crying out to God? No. They cried out to the wrong God 
and they got an answer. See, it's not a problem for us theologically to be searching for God's presence and looking for God's rescue and have it be the wrong God and have that wrong God answer. That's not problematic for us theologically. An advent does happen, but it's not God. And so we have to pause here at this moment and recognize that King Ahaz believes that he has been rescued from his enemies. He thinks the enemy of my enemies is my friend. And so he pledges himself and his loyalty to a God who cares nothing about him, to a man who cares nothing about him. He takes the treasures from the temple of God, whom he has pledged as a king to love and to follow, and he gives them to another rescuer. We have to recognize at this point in the story that Ahaz is very happy, that Judah is very happy, that they are celebrating, and they didn't even need God. While the king of Judah comes out of his castle, and he goes up to Damascus, and he meets with this God, this foreign king. He sees this foreign king offering sacrifices and loving a different God, and Ahaz says, that's beautiful. This rescue is beautiful. You know what I bet? This is conjecture. I just want you to know that. This is conjecture. This is me talking into the text. I'm reading between the lines here. This is not scripture. You don't have to believe it, but here's what I think. I think that possibly Ahaz even believed in his wicked heart that this rescue was from God. That the treasure that was stored up in the temple of God was there for just this occasion to pay off this foreign god. I think that he probably even got the people of Judah to celebrate this form of rescue. Maybe even praise Yahweh for this foreign king and for this treachery that they were able to pull off, not only against God, but also against their brothers, the Israelites. And Uriah the priest built the altar in accordance with all that King Ahaz had sent from Damascus. So Uriah the priest made it before King Ahaz arrived from Damascus. And when the king came from Damascus, the king viewed the altar. Then the king drew near to the altar and went up on it and burned his burnt offering and his grain offering and, his, and poured his drink offering and threw the blood of his peace offerings on the altar. And the bronze altar that was before the Lord, he removed from the front of the house, from the place between his altar and the house of the Lord and put it on the north side of his altar." Here's where, if it wasn't scary before, King Ahaz not only takes this other altar because it's more beautiful, because he likes that other god more, we don't know, but he takes this other altar and he sets it up in the temple in such a way that it doesn't make sense to have God's plain bronze altar where it is anymore. So he cuts it out. And he takes it and he places it next to the big altar. And then he climbs the stairs of the big altar and he does what God commanded in his word that the sacrifices should be. He does Jewish practice on a foreign altar. And King Ahaz commanded Uriah the priest saying, On the great altar burn the morning burnt offering and the evening grain offering and the king's burnt offering and his grain offering with the burnt offering of all the people of the land and their grain offering and their drink offering and throw on it all the blood of the burnt offering and all the blood of the sacrifice. But the bronze altar shall be for me to inquire by. Uriah the priest did all this as King Ahaz commanded. Do you notice... Ahaz isn't cutting God out of the picture. A friend of mine once said, as he was 
dealing with his addictions. He said, I have one foot in the light, and I have one foot in the dark, and I know that there is a, a war going on over my soul. And I told him, brother, you've got two feet in the dark. There's no war going on for your soul. The battle is lost. You cannot pour out the proper sacrifices on the wrong altar. And you cannot leave God's altar up next to it just in case you need him. If that happens, you're already lost. You're already gone. Let me ask you this question. I want to give you at least 30 seconds to ponder on this very, very serious thing. Where is the presence of God? You need to think about that right now. I want you to answer this question in your heart. Where is the presence of God? Where are you looking? Ahaz is crying out, Peace! Peace! I want peace! But he looks in the wrong spot. He looks to the wrong God, and he gets rescued. Which is the shameful thing of it. That's the horrid thing of it. We can see the serpent from Genesis at work here because this is a deceit. The immediate results cry out, you were right. But the people become further from God. Now, remember this altar, okay? This bronze altar that is just north of the new main altar. What's it for? For the king to inquire by. Because there was this tradition that if, you, if there was a battle coming or if there was something serious that the people needed, the king could walk down to the temple and he could say, inquire of the Lord. Shall I go up to battle tomorrow? Shall we meet them on the hills or on the plains? And the Lord, through a prophet, would respond. So I just want you to note, Ahaz hasn't abandoned God. He doesn't think he has, but he actually has. Into this, the prophet of Isaiah is preaching. Now, the book of Isaiah spans what we think is about 64 years of ministry. Uh, but we are going to be reading from Isaiah. We're going to start in 8 verse 20. We're going to go through 9 verse 7. Now, this section comes from the exact, the historical context that I have just read to you, okay? This is, this is not a prophecy that is coming at some other time. This is for this time. It is at the day that King Ahaz's reign starts. He was a co-regent before. Uh, he and his father, his father was struck down with leprosy for uh, disobeying God. And, um, and so his father, who wasn't dead yet, needed a front man. Ahaz was that front man. Um, for about 12 years, I believe. Isaiah started his ministry, or this section of prophecy, at least on the day that King Uzziah died. So King Ahaz is the guy who's in charge. Now, after this whole debacle happens with Assyria, Isaiah gets this vision of God that I told you before. He's up on high, his glory's filling the earth, and the hem of his robe is in the temple. He goes on this I'd call it a diatribe, but the theological word is prophecy. He goes on this prophecy. He's railing against this king on behalf of God. He has this testimony. He has scriptures in one hand and his testimony in the other. And God says to him, I will send you, just to make sure that you're on the right track, Isaiah, I'm going to send you some faithful guys. And Uriah the priest, this guy who built up this altar and all this other sort of stuff, is one of those guys. He's really good at keeping the word. And so they would write down these testimonies. And then when Isaiah would deliver them, they would sort of proverbially have in hand the scriptures of Israel, the law, and they would have in the other hand a scroll of everything that Isaiah is saying written down and bound up. God is talking to Isaiah and he says, here's what I want you to say. You have put your trust in allowing this mighty river of Assyria 
to overflow its banks, that it might sweep into Israel and Syria and Edom. Well, let me tell you what. You have been deceived. This river that overflows its banks is going to sweep into Judah. And it will, the water will be so high, you will be up to your neck. And as you deliver this prophecy, would you tell them this? You want to know what they're going to say back to you? That's good. Okay. Now, let's go to this other altar over here, and let's bring some necromancers in. Let's bring some wizards and some witches, you know, the ones that chirp and mutter. And let's see what they have to say. So we're going to pick up with God's words here in 820. To the teaching and the testimony. This line is important. What he's saying is, necromancers? Go to the teaching. Go to the testimony. Go to my word. If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. God is saying both of their feet are in the dark. And if they don't even go to my word, to my testimony, there's no morning for them. The light will never come up on them. But instead, they will pass through the land, greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward. They're, they're going to do Advent quite marvelously. But instead of saying, God, I need you, they're going to go like this. You bastard! They'll be so hungry. They'll be so distressed. They'll be in so much anguish that they will not be able to know who God is. They will even be devoid of His Word. And when they cry out, it will not be for rescue. It will be for cursing. And they will look to the earth but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. Now, this thick darkness is actually the exact opposite of what we talked about last week. They translate it the same, but if I can give you sort of a word for word of the Hebrew, the good thick darkness is the cloudy cloud, the fog that shields God's holiness and glory from a people who are being drawn to him. This thick darkness is the gloomy gloom, the pitch blackness where there is no presence of God. It is the exact same word for the plague when God um, puts the plague of darkness on the people of Egypt so that they could not see a hand in front of their face. They would light candles and yet they would give off no light. So thick was the darkness. God says, Oh, you want to wander away from my presence, do you? You want to curse me, do you? You want the thick darkness, do you? I'll give you thick darkness. Notice who this thick darkness is for. If they will not speak according to this word. This is for the people who not only have forgotten how to look for God's presence, and where to look for God's presence, and how to identify God's presence. Those people will not even listen to the prophet who is preaching good news to them. This is not God coming in and laying waste or th thrusting into the darkness a good and holy people who are trying really hard. This is for a people who have gotten so used to God's forgiveness, they don't even care who he is. They don't care about sharing their marriage bed. They don't even know how to recognize his voice when it's printed in black and white and sitting in front of them with the prophet of the Lord saying, this is what God will do. They'll say, yeah, yeah, that's good. Now let's go talk to some other people about that. For them, God will give up. He will allow them to be without him. But there will be no gloom. Excuse me, let me, let me give you just... Um, a little attention to detail in the prophecy here. There's this will be thing, and basically all you have to know is that Isaiah is inviting you into a time machine. 
he's sort, of, he's sort of standing before you with the printed word, black and white, this is what's going to happen. And then he sort of wants to wrap his arms around you and take you in time forward to when God, when Advent happens. And so he's going to be talking to you, the reader, as if you're there with him at this advent of God, at this point in the prophecy. There will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun, the land of Nephalti. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. So Isaiah is immediately putting people into two camps. He's saying this darkness is coming. But fast forward with me to the advent of God. There will be people who are totally lost. And they are totally lost not because God's presence can't be found, not because the light isn't shining, but because they don't know what the light looks like. They're lost in utter darkness as the people in the land of Egypt during the plague of darkness, though the light is shining for them, they will not be able to see it. Go talk to your dead. Go use the necromancers. Use the witches and the wizards. Inquire by my altar. I've given you my answer. I have given you my word. There's going to be a people. The flood of Assyria is going to come over northern Israel, Judah's neighbor. They are going to be, because of Judah's treachery, the first ones marched off into captivity. They are the ones who are going to be destroyed. And God says, they are the ones who get the first taste of the nastiness. They are the first ones who get to see the light. If they're looking for it, they will see it. And this light is going to draw people in. And they're going to be rejoicing. They're going to be so happy because they know this is the advent. This is the coming of God. This is the response to our crying out. It's here. They're going to be happy because they will be growing in number as they come towards this light. Like the farmer who's waited for a long time and his family's starting to get hungry and they've got a long winter ahead of them and all of a sudden the crop is ripe and ready for harvest. New beginnings, people. The end of rationing. Let's have a feast. As in the people who, who go forward and win a great victory and there's all these spoils of war laying about, all this silver and this gold just there for the taking. And these people will be like the people who are like, one for you and two for me and three for you and four for me. There's tons to go around. The yoke of his burden. Now this is the person who's coming towards the light. The staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian for every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult. Every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. He's creating a picture here, a picture of something that happened in the days of Gideon when they had this victory over Midian. And they had this victory over Midian through God's advent, through him coming up. And actually, the Israelites, the people of Israel, didn't fight. They stood on the edge of the camp with pots, hiding torches, and trumpets. And at the sound of a shout, they all smashed the pots so that the torches could be seen, and they blew their trumpets. The army of Midian was so alarmed and so scared, the Spirit of God kind of rushed on them, and they heard the sound of a charging army. And they all got up, drew their swords, and started slaughtering one another and running away as fast as they could. And Isaiah is saying here, those people who are lost in darkness, who are crying out for peace, they're going to see this light, they're going to come towards it, they're going to be rejoicing, and something's going to happen like this. This yoke that is on their neck will be broken. This staff that is on their shoulder 
which could be like a staff that goes out this way and holds water pots. This could also be the staff of somebody who's using it as a walking stick, but is so tired they have to sort of lean it on their shoulder as they're walking. That's the one I prefer. And the rod of the oppressor is this stick. There's somebody walking right behind them, beating them. But as they come towards the light, all of these things will be shattered. There will be a peace that is accomplished that will not be through a piece of arms. It will not happen by this bloody victory. These things that used to be trophies of war are going to be burned in rejoicing because the battle's already over. We don't need the old veterans to pull out their bloody garments and go like, let's go get them. Like the, bat the battle's already over. You can put away your combat boots. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called. Wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of his peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice, with righteousness from this time and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. <clears throat> I'm sorry if I start to get emotional as I preach this particular passage. But God has laid this heavy burden on my heart for these words right here. And if you could walk away with anything in your pocket this morning, I hope that it will be this. This amazing victory that God is promising. This shattering, this breaking of the rod, this light that is going to be shining will be a baby. Uh... <clears throat> For to us, a child is born. And when the prophet uses this word, he's leaving something unclear so that you will ask a question. He says, for to us, a child is born, and to us, a son is given. And what he means to say is that there's something extra going on here. It's like if I were to say to you, I had the most amazing time last night. We were at some place really special. And then I sort of leave this hanging pause. And what I'm trying to do when I say that to you is get you to go, where were you last night? What were you doing? He says, to us, a child is born. He means, it will be one of us. To us, a son shall be given. What do you mean? What do you mean he'll be given? I thought he was born. Who's going to give us a son that's already ours? The government shall be upon his shoulders. Now, there are some people who will point to this passage and they will say, this talks about the coming kingdom of Jesus. There's a second coming. As if this didn't already happen. I want to say to you this morning, this doesn't say the government shall be under his feet. This says the government shall be on his shoulder. I want you to imagine this big, super burly dude, this Samson type, this Brock Lesnar type, this big, giant, 400-pound man who is just rippling in muscle and stands about a head taller than me. I want you to imagine that I have this yoke on my neck called the government, and I just can't lift it as if I've got this giant sheet of plywood with sacks of concrete on the top, and it's making me bend over low. You will know the advent of God, this holy child, because he's not going to trample on the government. He's going to come right next to you, and he's going to put the government on his shoulder. And then he's going to do this stand-up thing. And all of a sudden, this burden will be totally lifted off your shoulders. It's not gone. It just rests on this holy child. And if you're standing next to him, you get to belong to his government. His government, which isn't like the governments that we know now. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. 
you will know that this is the coming child because he is going to say marvelous things. Wonderful counselor, like an amazing teacher, somebody who gives advice that's going to blow your mind. It's going to sort of teach you the ways of God in a way that you, you ne- is just going to totally open up your eyes. It'll be wonderful. When he teaches you, you'll go, that's amazing. You will call him mighty God. You will know that he is like me because he will be able to bend the rules of nature, change the rules of nature to accomplish his will. He will do the acts of a mighty God. As God says, out of Egypt I shall draw my people with mighty acts and a mighty hand. This child will have that. His name will be Everlasting Father. Now, for any Trinitarian, this is a wonderful passage and a scary passage because Isaiah the prophet tells us, you will call this child God the Father, Everlasting Father. And I don't need to take a theological stance on this because no matter what I say, it will most likely be heresy. But I would invite you to just sort of look at that and go, that's so crazy. It defies understanding that a child who's given to us, a son that is given to us, born to us, will be God the Father, the everlasting Father. At least you're going to have to admit to yourself, this breaks some rules. This is kind of like a burning bush that is not consumed. You know what? God can do that. And no, it doesn't make sense. And if you are watching a burning bush that is not consumed, you can be sure that you're seeing something from God because only He can do that. Only God could be Father and Son. The last name that they call him here is the Prince of Peace. And in the Bible, they call the devil the Prince of the Power of the Air. There's the Prince of Power, and there's the Prince of Peace, who delivers peace not through power in a traditional sense, but through humility. God will come in a way that is so humble that is so wonderful, and you will know that it is Him, because those people who are around Him, everything that comes out of Him will be peace. Of the increase of His government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over His kingdom to establish it, to uphold it with justice, with righteousness, from this time forth and forevermore. He is preaching this message to a king, who sits on the throne of David. And he says, the advent of the Lord that is coming is that there will be a king on high who steps off of his throne to be under the government. And when he does that, when he's under the government, he will be what you, King Ahaz, could never be. And he will sit on the throne of David in a way that totally fulfills what the people of God need. They don't need a human king. They need an everlasting king. They need a new government. They need the prince of peace to sit on that throne, to uphold it with justice and with righteousness, not for a short time, not for a limited duration. This is going to be one of those times that is an everlasting advent, This is going to be something that through the ages, the people of the earth who are looking for the great light will be able to hang on to. And this this last line just blows me away. Because this word right here, zeal, the zeal of the Lord, if this were talking in a human context, the translators would have translated it jealousy, lustful passion. People are so broken, so stuck, so crying out. God is filled. His heart is kindled. It's this flame of passion. Like 
when a young man looks at a beautiful young woman and goes, I so want that forevermore. I want to marry that girl. They're already, God and Israel are already married. Israel's lost her passion for God. But God's passion is everlasting. His lust is everlasting. His zeal is everlasting. And it is this zeal, this refusal to be conquered by rejection, that is going to be distilled down into a humble child. Amen? Amen. Is that good news? That God's passion and His jealousy for us burns so hot and so bright that giving Him the cold shoulder won't work. Which is good because human beings aren't designed to dwell in sin. They aren't designed to deal with sin. They're designed to be in love with God. And when we have sin in our lives, it causes us to give God the cold shoulder. And God says, as long as... He, he doesn't even say, you have to turn your, your heart always has to be turned towards me. You always have to be in love with me. This new advent is that God is going to say, I will do that for you. God is going to say, I will not leave you to your own devices to love me, but my passion, the way that I feel, will put on skin and walk amongst you. You will be able to hug him. You will be able to cuddle him. You will be able to be sitting on a mountainside listening to his teachings and be totally amazed. You will be able to be sitting in a boat totally afraid. And the Prince of Peace, the mighty God, will be able to Say, why don't you have any faith? Peace be still. And the whole ocean will be stilled. That's how much peace he has, how much passion he has for you. I want to uh, ask you then some questions. And this part of the sermon is what some people might call practical application. Unfortunately, I don't have anything practical for you to do. But I have some, some soul-searching questions and some things that you need to look at in your life. You have to actually consider these things. Don't be like the people who wouldn't even go to the Word and to the testimony. You have to know what to look for if you want peace. So what peace are you looking for? In order for that to happen, you first have to recognize utter darkness. And I want you to think right now, where is the presence of God lacking in my life? Where is there utter darkness? And let me give you just some objective ways that you could know, so we're not just talking metaphorically, the places where you're hungry, where you have a deep hunger, the places where you find deep rage, the places where gloom and anguish creep up, the places where you despair, those are places of utter darkness. Consider, if you would, this morning, bringing those things before the Lord. Ask yourself this question. Am I at peace? This is one of the, such the, the beautiful things. You can tell a Christian Christmas versus a secular Christmas by this one thing alone. Is this about a celebration of peace and of being at peace? Or is this about getting whipped up and crazy? Friends, if you're getting whipped up and crazy, you're missing it. 
would you recognize peace when it showed up? Who are you crying out to? Will you make the mistake like King Ahaz did and believe that your rescue can be found by the enemy of your enemy? Or will you cry out to God? I asked you last week to consider the spots where you might be stifling your screams. Don't do that. Don't be quiet in the places of utter darkness. As you're crying out to God, just know, know that He has promised in His Word for the dawn, for the morning, for the light. He has promised it. And for us, it is not a thing far off, but a thing very near. There is a Savior. He is the passion of the Lord. And He wants you. Isaiah tells us His name is Emmanuel, God with us. This is the advent that God is walking with us. He's not over us and on high alone anymore. He still is that, but he is standing in our midst. So this week we are going to light some advent candles. And I want to go over what they mean. And I want to invite you this week to light those candles in your heart. These are flames that remind us that there is someone coming, that there is rescue. And our first candle is waiting for that rescue. It's the lighthouse set on the shore to remind the ships that there's someone there. It's like the candle in the windowsill left for the soldier who has yet to come home. This says, we're still here, God, and we need you. The second flame is a need, a need for God's fire and God's flame to stay holy, but to invite us in. As Moses in the burning bush. Our third candle is a search for his presence. It's saying, God, there are places where we are without you, and we don't want that. We want you. And this week we light a candle, which is our prayer for peace. I would invite our usher to come up. I'm going to pray this morning over the, the reading and the acceptance of God's Word. I also want to pray for our offering and invite our worship team to come up. Heavenly Father, you are amazing. You don't lack for anything and certainly not for love and passion. We thank you that you are a God who has done all things for us and through us, so loving, so concerned for us, you sent your Son to walk among us, to accomplish what we could not. Father, I ask that you would bless this word to our hearts, this testimony to our lives. I pray that you would accept our offerings, and I pray, O oh Lord God, that you would help us to look for your advent. In your name I pray. Amen.